So to start this lecture, I guess we could start just thinking about where we are. We are on a continent, North America. We have two oceans, one to the east, one to the west. Atlantic to the east, Pacific to the west. And everywhere else is the atmosphere. In fact, if you think about it, and this is fact, atmosphere and the oceans are the biggest laboratory you can have on this planet. They are much bigger than Earth, solid Earth. They are not bigger than the universe, but as I said, on our planet, these are the biggest uh, laboratories. Now, if we go to the atmosphere, air in this room, and pretty much everywhere else, is 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and if you sum up these numbers, you get 99, which means 1% other gases. And these other gases are mostly argon, and then carbon dioxide, water vapor, and so on. Oxygen is necessary for life and many other processes in the atmosphere, as you will, I will not talk about that today, but you would talk about that in courses on uh, atmospheric radiation. Nitrogen, not so important, sometimes important. But the thing is, and oceans are water, similar to water that we drink, just a little bit saltier. Now, if you think the atmosphere was not always like that. Well, at the beginning of time for our Earth, which is about 4.6 billion years ago, when the whole solar system was formed through gravitational collapse of uh, dust and rocks, our Sun formed and Earth also formed some 4.5 billion years ago. And at that time, Earth was a giant, massive ball of fire. There was no atmosphere. Any gases that would be around solid Earth would be ejected into outer space. So if there was any atmosphere, but probably none, that would be hydrogen and helium. Because these two gases are the most abundant gases in the universe. So it's logical to expect they were also here. However, over millions and millions of years, the Earth started cooling down. It wasn't any more giant ball of fire. And the Earth started getting its atmosphere. Now, how did gases get into the atmosphere? How did we get first gases around the Earth? Well, research suggests that composition of gases in volcanic eruptions and uh, steam vents was the same throughout the history of our planet. However, back at those times, there were way more many volcanoes than today. So the first gases came from the Earth through volcanic eruptions and steam vents. But there is issue here. If you now measure composition of gases in volcanoes, you get that it's mostly water vapor, about 80%. Then you get carbon dioxide, about 10%. You get few percent of SO2 and few percent of nitrogen, sulfur dioxide, namely. These are few percentages. So if you compare these two, you will see they do not match. We have mostly nitrogen, but there is only few percent of nitrogen in volcanic eruptions. How about oxygen? There is no oxygen to begin with. So if you want, this is the first stage of the atmosphere, if it existed to begin with. Then the next stage of the atmosphere is the atmosphere that was very rich on CO2, as well as water vapor. But as I said, as the Earth was cooling down, this water vapor started condensing, and we started having precipitations. At some point, for thousands and thousands of years, there was rain on this planet. Now, as the rain uh, was falling for eons, we started having oceans and rivers. And it happens that oceans are extremely efficient at acquiring CO2. So once you started having oceans, this CO2 starts escaping from the atmosphere. Then, about 540 million years ago, there is life on this planet. It's called Cambrian Explosion. Well, 
life first started in ocean, and microbes in ocean, they consume also CO2. When they die, that CO2 gets locked in rocks and sediments, so you start getting rocks on this planet. Around, I don't know, 470, 60 million years ago, you start having plants outside of the ocean. Plants additionally consume CO2, release oxygen as a byproduct. So as you can see, as the time is passing, our early atmosphere is getting less and less CO2 through various biological and chemical processes, and it's getting more O2. How about SO2? SO2 is very reactive and it dissolves in water, so it falls down to get with, together with precipitation. And then the only question is, how did we get this nitrogen? Because there is only a few percent of nitrogen in these volcanic eruptions. Well, this gas is not very reactive. So when you release it, release it into the atmosphere, it stays there almost forever, for a very long time. So these few percentages accumulated over millions and millions of years. So here we are today in this classroom, breathing 78% of nitrogen, 21% of oxygen, and about 1% of other gases, mostly argon, uh, which is a noble gas if you study chemistry. Uh, also because it doesn't react with other gases very much. So it accumulates over the time. Now, if you, this is a little bit about, what I just described is called paleoclimatology. So you're studying climate of distant past, and that study is very linked to geology and hydrology or ocean dynamics of distant past. Now, if we look into these gases that are making up air around us, you would see that one molecule or atom of a gas is extremely small, unimaginably small. Diameter of an atom is 10 to power negative 10 meters. That's 0 0.901. That's just crazy how small it is. It is so small that now when you breathe, you take one liter of air with every breath. Now, when I said that, usually you're heart pumps more and you take a little bit more because you think about it. It's like when they measure pressure, it's always a little bit higher than it's supposed to be because you get excited. Now, in one liter of air that you just inhaled, there is approximately 10 to power 22 atoms of air. That is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 22 zeros after one. Our human brains cannot comprehend these numbers. There is no way you sit here and after seven minutes you're like, okay, now I figured it out, it's big. This is so big that the number of stars in observable universe is this number. In all galaxies, entire universe, number of stars is equal to number of atoms that you just inhaled in one breath. No, nature is just crazy. There is an interesting coincidence. We can calculate that there is approximately 10 to power 44 atoms or molecules in the entire atmosphere. In one breath, you take, one, you take, you take 10 to 22. So imagine this. If you would sit here, either of you, every time you inhale, that air disappears. Imagine you do not exhale anything. There is total of 10 to power 22 breaths of, the in, of air in this atmosphere. If you would take this many breaths, you would consume all air in this atmosphere. It would take age of the universe or something like that, but still. However, this is not really, this is called kinetic theory of gases, and it connects to atmospheric thermodynamics. This is not how we study air in day-to-day -day, uh, research. We study air and oceans, water, as a bulk substance. So there are certain properties we analyze, and these properties are, let's say, temperature, pressure, 
I don't know, density of air or water, wind or uh, current velocity in oceans, name it, visibility, cloud cover, concentration of pollutions, and so on. These are bulk properties, like temperature, for example. Temperature is jiggling of atoms around you. High temperature, high jiggling. Low temperature, low jiggling. That's why you get burned when you put your hand on the stove. Because atoms in your hand are also jiggling. But jiggling of the stove is much higher. So when you put your hand on the stove, which you shouldn't do, what will happen is that that huge amount of jiggling transfers to your fingers and the structural composition of your skin cannot take it and it breaks apart. And you say, I burned my hand. Should I say that word again? It's just jiggling of atoms, nothing else. Okay, <laughs> absolutely nothing else. Pressure is the force of air that is pushing on you. But you push back so you don't feel it. And we evolved here on this planet where we can sustain pressures. Go one kilometer below water and you'll see you'll die. Because pressure is very, very high. Okay? Now, from these micro properties of air, I'll describe how temperature and pressure change in the atmosphere. Okay? I forgot to advance slides. Here I supposed to say, but now we breathe this beautiful air, but I forgot. Anyways. Uh, <laughs> but if we go to temperature field, so now we can be, so I said temperature is a quantity of air and water that we can measure and analyze. Here is uh, planet Earth, North America, South America, Africa, Asia. What you will see, this is mean weekly temperature for the period 1979-2000. So you take first week of January, you average all these 30 years, second week and so on, okay? Doing measurements that Ju Julianne will discuss and other, uh, we can measure temperature across the globe. And you can see that in tropical regions, temperatures are high. North Pole, South Pole, temperatures are low. And here in our mid-latitudes, it's something between. This is temperature in degrees Celsius at two meters above the ground. So through measurements and presenting data in a proper way, which is another part of this uh, point that I'm making, you can learn a lot about spatial and temporal structure of various quantities. If I run this animation, then what you will see is as the months are progressing, notice how the region of high temperatures is moving north. Do you see? As the summer, in, and then as the winter is coming, cold air is going down. So you can see that in summer, region of hot air is moving northward in the summer in northern hemisphere. In winter, cold air is advancing down. You took physics, I assume, or something. So it's like a linear oscillator, like a spring, uh, like going up and down year after year. You can also see, I mean, I could now spend two hours talking about it, but you can also see the differences in temperature, what we call meridional direction, that fancy word south to north, are much larger than in what we call zonal direction, which is west to east. But even in west to east, there are some differences. That's caused by inhomogeneities, ocean to land, mountains, different type of land, and so on. But how about in the vertical direction? How does temperature change in the vertical direction? Anybody knows? Yes. Yes. Was that? It decreases with altitude? Partially correct. Decreases up to a certain altitude, then starts increasing, okay. then I think it decreases again. Yeah. Okay, I wanted to say there is no good answer, but he actually gave good answer. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so okay. 
You want to come here and do it with me? You know how it goes? I, I think it's, it's okay. up to minus 56 degrees Celsius. So if here is temperature in degrees Celsius, and what he corrected me correctly, when I say vertical, I need to define what is vertical. That's altitude. And if here is altitude in kilometers, average global temperature is 15 degrees Celsius. Okay, if you take all stations around the world, average over the whole year, you get something like this. Temperature first decreases. Everybody, both of you were correct. And it decreases at a rate of about 6.5 degrees per every kilometer that you go up. And it decreases up to a height of about 10 kilometers. 9, 10, 11, in tropical regions, 18. Because we are in Montreal, I'll say 10. So here, at these heights, temperature is about negative 56, 57, 8. I'll say 60. It's a nice number. And then it wiggles to be a little bit constant or so, up to 20 kilometers or so. And then it again increases up to some height of about 50 kilometers. And uh, here, temperature ends up being about negative 20 or so. So you could live at 50 kilometers. There is not enough air for you to survive, but in terms of temperature, you would be just fine. Okay. Now, after 50 kilometers, it again wiggles here something constant, doesn't matter, and then goes down again, up to height of about 80 kilometers. And here, Temperature, this is the coldest part on our planet. Temperatures reach negative 90, well, be generous and say negative 80. And then it again maybe wiggles, we are not very sure, and then increases. But now it's uncertain. It increases like this, like that, like this. It can sometimes even be constant. Because this is so far away and the air is so rare, we cannot talk about temperature pressure in these convenient ways that we talk about at this planet. What I want to say, temperature here depends largely on activity of our sun. If sun is active, you have high temperature and so on. What is so specific about these regions? This is, by the way, called troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere. All weather that is of interest for us is in the stratosphere. This is also where we live, all of us, to my knowledge. Uh, then you go stratosphere. What is so interesting about stratosphere? Anybody knows? Huh? Nobody knows? Ozone layer. When you go to the beach and you come back home alive, that means you should always thank ozone that is on this Maximum of the ozone is about 30, 32 kilometers. That's where the ozone absorbs 99% of UV light. That 1% that passes is what burns your skin. Then you go here into the uh, mesosphere. By the way, mesosphere, stratosphere together are called middle atmosphere. This is lower atmosphere. This is upper. Anyways, uh, you will talk about this more, huh? Okay, so I don't want to take you. You will hear from Julianne some interesting facts about each of these layers. And this goes up to great heights. There is no solid lead where our atmosphere ends. It's approximately between 5,000 and 10,000 kilometers. That's where the air, but really when I say air, I mean individual atoms escape into interplanetary uh, space in our that's temperature in the atmosphere. How about oceans? Here is height, z equals zero. Depth increases down. Average global temperature of oceans is 20 degrees Celsius. First, you wiggle again, be a little bit constant in first few hundred meters. And then after 200, 300 meters, temperature sharply decreases with depth up to about one kilometer. 
This is for that figure. Uh, and here, temperature is just about 4 degrees Celsius, but not quite. It reaches 4 degrees somewhere here. So we have pretty much constant layer, this called thermocline, layer of very rapid decrease of temperature with depth from 200 to 100 meters, depends where you are, up to one kilometer. And then water, maximum density of water is at 4 degrees Celsius. Hence, at the bottom of the ocean, temperature is about 4 degrees Celsius. Okay. So that's how temperature changes in the atmosphere and the oceans. I'll discuss pressure and stop there because pressure is so easy. Anybody knows how pressure decreases with height? Uh, for altitude, it decreases as you go up. For depth in the ocean, it increases as you go down. Yes. Correct. But before that, I again forgot that this is how pressure looks like on average on our planet. You can see we have permanent pressure. Well, some of them are permanent, like this one. Permanent high pressure. So this is pressure in millibars. The same gen uh, 1979, 2000 averaged. By the way, millibar, it's a disgusting uh, measure of pressure that we use. You know that official measure of pressure is Pascal. One millibar is one hectopascal. Or that would be 100 pascals. But it is what it is. It, it gets even worse in when you start measuring energy. Officially, it's joule. Uh, who goes to the gym and says, well, I burned so many joules, or kilowatt hours, or something like that. So there is calories, joules, kilowatt hours. I don't know. It's just mess, OK, with these units. Uh, but here you can see permanent high pressure regions. Here, too, low pressure somewhere around equator. And there are these low pressure regions next to Alaska and Iceland. Now, if I run this again uh, throughout a year, you will see the evolution of uh, how some, like here, above uh, Siberia, actually the high pressure region beco becomes low pressure region in summer and so on. Okay. Now, this pressure field temperature field, wind field, and every other field are related. And that's what you would study in our courses. Okay? They are, on these big scales, they are related to something called general circulation of the atmosphere. Okay? Now, in the vertical direction, pressure, what he said was right, decreases. Here is pressure. Here is height in kilometers. Average pressure at sea level is 1,000. 13.25 millibars, and then pressure decreases. Do you know what is the functional uh, dependency of this line? How do we call it? This is linear. Linear means straight line. Dig, 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 dig. <coughs> How do we call this curve line? It's exponential decrease. OK? Uh, so for example, that means pressure decreases with altitude much faster than temperature. So at approximately 5.5 kilometers, pressure is 500 millibars. That's approximately half of this value at the surface. Now in our courses, let's say synoptic meteorology and so on, you will learn that pressure can be related to the mass of the air. So when we say that 500 millibars is at 5.5 kilometers, and 500 millibars is approximately half of this. That means half of the mass of the atmosphere is below 5.5 kilometers. <coughs> you see how fast it drops. That means 90% of mass of our atmosphere is in first 10 kilometers. That's crazy. At 50 millibars, uh, sorry, at 50 kilometers, it's just one millibar. That means 99.9% .9 of air, mass of the air, is below 50 kilometers. So this also tells you how density of air at these heights is so negligible. Where we are now, there are, as I said, atoms around us. Each atom or molecule 
crosses 10 to power negative 7 meters before colliding with other atoms. So they're just zigging around, hitting each other. At these heights, they cross about one kilometer before they hit, the, before they find a partner to collide. So that's how rare the air is at these altitudes, okay? Any questions? Well, I, will, I could now go on and on, but it would become boring. So I will stop here about talking about these things. So I described a little bit about chemistry, a little bit about history of our atmosphere and planet, a little bit about these major variables, what we call quantities, that we use to describe atmosphere and how they behave in space and time. Now, uh, I mean, I don't know, I could talk about so many things, but uh, I will talk about one of the major topics of meteorology and, uh, oh yeah, by the way, pressure, what he said, in the oceans decreases linearly with depth. For every 10 meters, one atmosphere. So 10 meters of water has the same pressure as the entire atmosphere above that, okay? So you go 20 meters, there are three atmospheres above you. Real atmosphere and two atmospheres from 20 meters of water. Anybody scuba diving here? Nobody scuba diving? Wow, this is unacceptable. Uh, well, this is something you would study a lot, okay, if you scuba dive, so you don't get injured, let's put it like that. Uh, so, weather forecasting, yes. So, that's one of the central topics, if not the central topic of meteorology and atmospheric sciences. And weather forecasting, we do it without thinking about it. I mean, clothes that you have today are based on weather, okay? If this was summer, probably you would come here differently dressed, okay? Hopefully, you also have something for rain because probably it's gonna start raining around 4 p.m., okay? Uh, something like that. Just disregard the uh, noises. Uh, so, uh, what I described there is kind of climate. Okay, I am kind of on time. What I described here is kind of climate. Climate is some average over either space or time or both. So I told you average temperature on this planet is 15 degrees Celsius. Well, outside is not 15, okay? So from point to point, from time to time, that changes. And we want to be able to forecast how variables that I listed here will change with time and space. How do we do it? Anybody knows here, how is weather forecast actually done. What do people do? Yes? Well, they study the atmosphere at one point. Yes. Um, and they know, give or take, what direction it's moving in. And so then they can approximately guess what it's going to be when it gets there. Yeah. You took some atmospheric science courses or? Uh, huh? I pilot. Pilot. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then you know all this. That's correct. So the thing that we need to know is initial, and this is where the things are going to get mathematical, okay? So if you want to run away, this is the time to run away. Uh, so uh, you need to know initial conditions, and you need to know laws of physics, okay? Initial conditions are what we measure. That's what Julianne will talk about. And laws of physics is what you will study in great lengths. Now, you shouldn't take this as uh, something bad. There is nothing more enjoyable than walking down the street and understanding how the world around you works. And that's just laws of physics. That's what I do every day. Uh, so this is measurements. Well, this is laws of physics. Now, this is how it works. Here is McGill, here is Dawson College. I checked, well, not precisely, but it's about two kilometers distance. That's 200, 2,000 meters, okay? You started walking from Dawson College to McGill. Average speed of walking is 1.7 meters per second. 
But because you were so excited to come here and listen to this talk, I will round it to 2 meters per second. Okay? You were walking a little bit faster than usual just to get here on time. So you see, initial condition is you were here. I know your position. I know your speed. But the wind, I mean, uh, velocity is tricky. You also need to know direction. Because you could go to another direction, 2 meters per second, and end up in Toronto, and that would be horrible for us. Okay? So you need to know where you are going. So that's what we call vectors. Okay? And now, that's measurement. Somehow I know it. Initial condition. How do I predict when you will be here? I use law of physics. I know that velocity is distance or s some space over time. From here, I know that time is therefore space over velocity. Distance is 2,000 meters. You walked at 2 meters per second. I canceled meters. This ends up being 1,000 seconds, which is approximately 15 minutes. So I gave you forecast how long it will take you to get here. Beauty about studying these types of things is that at laws of physics do not care. They do not discriminate. I can replace you with air. And there is, there is wind blowing from D to M. If that wind is 2 meters per second, a parcel of air, some imaginary volume, of air will come from here to here in 15, 15 minutes. If it is a tractor moving from D to M, it's going to get there in 15 minutes. Doesn't matter. Okay? I always wanted to use the word tractor in teaching. And this was the perfect opportunity. So uh, there you go. One of my dreams fulfilled. Uh, okay? Any questions about this? Now, I told you that I will not hold back anything here, okay? Because I would like you to take good decision what you want to study. If you study this, you will understand the world around you like in any other field. But it might happen this is not for you. So my idol was Richard Feynman, great physicist. When he gave talk to uh, about quantum physics somewhere in Australia, I don't know, he said what I will say now. He basically said, what I am about to write here is what we write for graduate students. So it will take many years of your education to get to the equations that I will write. But these are equations that we use to forecast weather. Here, I knew your, your initial condition and the law of physics. The law of physics I used was V equal S over T. It happens that laws of physics that we use to forecast weather are much more difficult than this, way more difficult. Are you familiar with second Newton's law? So you know, we will start from there, and then, as always, it gets horribly complicated. <laughs> Mass times acceleration is force. This is how engineers use it. Because engineers, they know they're analyzing this, and they can calculate mass of this chair. We can't. We analyze air or water. It's very difficult to measure mass, so we rewrite this equation as acceleration is force over mass, and then for convenience we say mass is one kilogram, unit mass, okay? So you end up that acceleration is forces. Anybody knows what forces are acting on air? So acceleration is, for example, as every professor, I'll give you the easiest and then I usually ask more complicated from students. So gravity. Any other idea what force is acting on air? Uh, the pressure from adjacent particles. Pressure gradient force, which is a fundamental force in atmospheric sciences and oceanography. Any other force? Friction. But friction in fluids is called viscosity. If you drive a car when you need to buy oil, they tell you the viscosity of the oil needs to be such and such. Uh, that's friction. And there is a nasty Coriolis force. Okay, there are some other forces. 
So you will have courses teaching you about these forces, okay? How they act, how they are represented, and so on. But there are three directions of motion. So you know that you have to put this law in three different directions, right? X, Y, Z. In X direction, you get that pressure gradient force is negative one. Or I will write something. You will not understand anything. But then, did you study derivatives? Partial derivatives? Yeah. But then, uh, because they told me don't go heavy on mathematics, so I decided to write all equations here. That's the first equation of motion. Arguably, it's much more difficult than this law over here. Huh? So you see, acceleration, but it's just what I wrote here. Acceleration in the x direction is the pressure gradient force in the x direction. Viscous forces, friction is the most horrible force. It's the most difficult force. Friction, Coriolis force. Fortunately, we usually neglect this one, so you get at least a little bit. In the y direction, you get this. Now, I'm not going to. This is the same, except you put v. And here you get negative 2u omega sine phi. I'm not going to go explain now what is phi, what is what. But this is how air moves in the y direction. y direction, by the way, is south to north. In the vertical direction, we also have pressure gradient force. But in the vertical direction, there is also gravity, g. And then again, this nasty, horrible frictional force. And then also, there is here a little bit of uh, Coriolis force, but we usually neglect this as well. Uh, OK? Very complicated. The good news is you don't get to study this until graduate level, OK? But this is not the end. There is thermodynamics equation, OK? This is heat added to the body, some constant dt, dt, change of temperature. There is no temperature here. We have to account for temperature plus 1 over rho dp. Uh, negative, rather, dp dt, thermodynamics equation. There is mass continuity equation as well. That means when you open the window, air that comes in pushes air through the door out. Continuity has to be. Or if none of the air gets out through the door, density of air in this room increases. Very simple to say, very complicated equation. 1 over rho, d rho dt plus delta u delta x plus delta v delta y plus delta w delta z equals 0. And lastly, there is equation of state. p equal o r, the some constant e. Doesn't matter what these are, but these are, this is uh, typical. This is where we start. <laughs> this is where we end up. Now, these equations, nobody knows how to solve them. Nobody. Think about this. In my opinion, the greatest scientist that ever walked on this planet is Isaac Newton. Then maybe uh, Albert Einstein. That's subjective, OK? What's your name? Me? Yes. Maya. Maya. Maya, <laughs> if you solve these equations, your name will be right next to these greats. Nobody managed to solve them. They are so complicated. Now, some equations in mathematics we can demonstrate cannot be solved. But this one we cannot demonstrate we cannot solve. So many people tried, everybody failed. And not just mathematicians, physicists, chemists, atmospheric researchers, everybody, nobody. 
They're so difficult that if somebody would come here and say, oh, I do research solving these equations, we would say, no, no, seriously, what are you doing? Because we just don't believe. So how do we do things? How do we calculate? How do we solve these equations to get forecast? We introduce approximations. But any time you introduce approximation, there is some error involved. Okay? So that's why, first of all, these equations are solved by computers. The most advanced computers on this planet are used in atmospheric sciences and oceanography because the problem is so difficult. So you introduce approximations, you chop off accuracy. Measurements that we use are not perfect. Instruments are not holy grail. They have errors. And we don't have measurements everywhere. So that's another source of error. And errors tend to multiply. So at the end of the day, you get some error in your result. And that error results in forecast not being correct. However, today, our five to seven day forecast, so forecasting weather five to seven days in advance, are 80% accurate. In other words, today's forecasts, seven days in advance, are as accurate as one day forecast 60 years ago. That's because we learned better how to, not how to better approximate some of these terms. We have better instruments. We have more measurements. We have more people studying this field. And we also have better means of communicating the results. Okay. So consequently, because weather is so important, the focus is on four. Oh, I have one more minute. This is perfect. Focus is on extreme weather. Okay? So focus is on forecasting hurricanes like this. Focus is on forecasting hail, okay? particles of ice larger than 5 millimeters in diameter. This is disaster for cars and agriculture. Focus is on downburst. This is nasty thunderstorm releasing precipitation and downdraft. That's one of my fields of research, downburst. Downdraft hits the surface, spreads radially, creating high intensity winds. Focus is on tornadoes. Well, guess what? Nobody, there is no theory of tornado formation, complete theory. Doesn't mean we don't know anything. But nobody can tell you, OK, this cloud over there will produce tornado in 17 minutes. It will last this much and be that strong. Again, if you figure out that, then you will be, your name will be in the history of this field forever. Focus is on lightning. Oh, you want to see, you want to hear interesting statistics? Hmm? You know that 70% of people killed by lightning are men, only 30% women. Hmm? How about that? One of the reasons is that boys want to be like, oh, yeah, I'm not afraid of a uh, thunderstorm. But there is thunderstorm. Maybe you shouldn't go out. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> but thunderstorm cannot do anything to me. And then you end up being statistics, 70%, 30%. This is a true story. Uh, there is another reason. Flooding. Flooding is the costliest, probably, uh, natural disaster. Because it's also related, I mean, you can imagine when this water comes out, how much sewage and all bacteria and viruses comes up with it. Okay, so flooding is horrible. Oops. Blizzards. This is the famous storm. At that time, people were shoveling snow with ties. And uh, blizzard is condition where wind has to be above 11 meters per second. Visibility needs to be below 400 meters due to falling snow or wind blowing snow. And whole condition needs to last over four hours. In the US, three hours. But we are tougher. That's why we put four. Uh, heat waves, also, forecast of heat waves, extremely important. As you can see, I am two minutes over time, so I don't have time to talk about these. But at the end of the day, we also want to forecast beautiful weather like this picture of Quebec that I stole from the internet. <laughs> OK. OK. 
thank you and uh, I hope to see you soon.